welcome to the Elliot Church. If you're seeing this, church has probably been canceled, probably due to the weather. But it could be for other reasons, too. Anyway, we're happy you're here and watching this. This sermon that I'm about to give is one that I gave at a Unitarian Universalist uh, worship service at my seminary, Andover Newton Theological School, back in October. It was also printed in the UU Christian Fellowship's Good News Journal for Christmas 2014. It's titled Sacramental Life for Advent and Beyond. The scripture reading is from Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the, dark, of the waters. Unitarian Universalism is a sacramental religion. No, we do not have seven sacrament, formal sacraments, ritual markers of church life that cover every stage of life from birth to marriage and death as Roman Catholics do, nor even the baptism and the communion of the Protestant Christian churches, although both are practiced in our congregations. But sacraments, at their deepest, are a recognition that creation is good, that the physical world around us is a good thing that the presence, of the, the presence of the divine isn't a distant thing, but is something that inundates the whole world around us. And that, I think, is something that we're good at. Now, to be fair, that creation is a good thing can sometimes feel controversial. In Douglas Adams' Restaurant at the End of the Universe, sequel to The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Adams cheekily writes, in the beginning, the universe was created, this has made a lot of people very angry and has been widely regarded as a bad move. We might laugh at this now, but it is not an uncommon theological sentiment, particularly within Gnostic and some Buddhist traditions. But this is not the case within the Christian traditions that would birth Unitarianism, Universalism, and yes, humanism. I'll start at the beginning. In our scripture reading today, we heard the mythic story of creation at the beginning of Genesis. This is a lovely piece of poetry and myth, an explanatory text that tells us not about seven days, but that creation is good. God is well pleased with us and the creation of the world. Who we are and our place in the world is intimately tied into who we are as physical creatures and the physicality of the world around us. Something that you might, have, might not have noticed is that our world does not come from nothing. There's an odd phrase in the second verse, the face of the deep. Now, most of us might think that this is something of an archaic phrasing, a leftover from the King James Version of the Bible. After all, what waters have a face? But the Hebrew word here is pene, which literally does mean face. This starts to make a little more sense when we realize that the deep is actually to home, the Hebrew version of the goddess Tiamat. In Mesopotamian mythology, Tiamat is one of the most primordial beings, a goddess of the ocean who gives birth to other gods. She's a notable character in the Enuma Elish, uh, the epic myth of creation in that tradition, where Tiamat's, Tiamat's son, Marduk, kills her after her and her husband wage war against Marduk and the other younger gods. Some scholars, such as Walter Wink, have seen this violence against the female god, goddess Tiamat as an ex explanation for a move towards a patriarchal view of the gods and for the repression of women. I do not want to diminish this side of the story at all, but that is not mine to preach today. So this is the Tiamat that we see in the beginning of the story, her face literally covered in darkness. Then the Ruach Elohim, translated in the NRSV Bible as a wind from God, also the Holy Spirit, sweeps over the face of the waters, the darkened, deceased body of Tiamat. Ruach, literally a breath when humans do it, is usually understand, understood to be something like a mighty wind, a storm in this context. And out of that, creation begins to happen. I think it's interesting that God does not create something out of nothing. 
Notice that the stuff that God creates out of is actually the deceased body of Tehom, Tiamat. Tehom, as much as we do not worship her today, with some exceptions, is still with us. Because of her, we share a common origin. Out of the most sacred of vessels, laid low in death and violence, we have a common origin of the whole world. God's breath, a breath of love, a holy and mighty storm, reimagines this holiness into the world around us and ensures that life will continue on. Therefore, the boundary between the sacred and the secular is a hazy one at best, for all matter is made up of sacred stuff. And if you do not believe in God or Genesis or Tiamat, and if you believe that the creation stories belong in the dustbin of history, I understand. But I want you to consider this. Science tells us that we are made of the literal stuff of stars, exploding and swirling in the vastness of space, a small piece of the universe getting to know itself. And this should let, give you pause, should let you know that maybe we're onto something here. And for all of the poetic words that I have just said, I know that it is really hard to see the sacred and the ordinary most of the time. Really, really hard. And this is why sacraments matter and why we're pretty darn good at them. We mark deeply beautiful, mundane, human experiences, breaking bread, bathing, storytelling, as sacred and worthy of our respect and awe. And we do rituals pretty well. We have water communion and flower communion. We light chalices with sacred thoughtful words. These are the times and the places where the divine and the human, the sacred and the secular embrace in a timeless dance. It might be as small as Louis Armstrong's words, friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? When they're really saying, I love you. We are especially reminded of this relationship between the sacred and the secular in this time of Advent. The birth of Jesus, the indwelling of God into the world, was not into the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem, the regional, political, and religious center, but in little, little Bethlehem. The birth of a child in a farm town became the most holy act in the world, not a religious ceremony in the center of power with priests and sacrifices. In Jesus' life and ministry, his miracles are mostly through ordinary things, food, wine, broken human bodies. What Jesus did what that was special was he took ordinary things and he made them extraordinary. This example is one of the most important lessons of Jesus, that through, that through the work of our own hands, with assistance of of the boundless love and grace around, inside, and between us. That we too can transform the ordinary into the extraordinary. Jesus teaches us that we are not powerless to change the world around us, merely beholden to, force, to forces beyond our comprehension. But nor are we alone against the raging tide of the universe. So after the chaos and the beauty of the Advent season, after the pageants are done, Silent Night has been sung in candlelight and presents exchanged. We then realize that we did very little at all. Each childbirth has always been an encounter between the holy and the secular. Each encounter between two friends, two siblings, two lovers, a, an embrace of the secular and the sacred. And that each of us has always been holy, full of the grace and love that know no bounds. Amen. Nobody saw you in the background. Welcome. Can you see me? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the uh, to. <laughs> okay. Hello. <Well, that> <laughs> uh, and God saw that it was good, and I dropped the book. Hello, and welcome to the Outer Church.
If you're watching this, it means that we probably cancel church, either due to inclement weather or other factors beyond our power. Do we need cue cards? <laughs> I need a teleprompter. I'm Obama. Now we follow Lee. It's a tracking shot as she descends, gracefully descends <laughs> the staircase. <laughs> Oops. Oh god, I'm breaking this. I'm sorry, your camera's too complicated for I know, it's, it's not mine. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> there are actually apparently teleprompter apps. Really? That, like, you hook up your phone to a little mini screen and it does it. What do you do uh, if you get a free version and an ad comes up in the middle of your sermon? <laughs> and the Lord said, try Netflix free for two <laughs> months, try. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and on the seventh day God rested from all the work that he had done.